minutes. So, all right, we're gonna begin. So I'd like to welcome you all to our first of many life science industry speaker series for educators. My name is Marissa Molina and I am the senior project coordinator for Biocom Institute. Um, if you have, I'm going to be moderating this event. So if you have any questions at all during uh, the event, you can type them in the chat box and I'll be sure to um, let whoever is presenting at the time know that there's a question. Um, our mission here at Biocom Institute, if you've never come across us before, is to develop and promote a skilled and diverse pipeline of talent to accelerate the growth of California's life science ecosystem. We collaborate with the life science industry, government, nonprofits, the K-12 um, and community college systems, institutions of higher education and other stakeholders to meet and anticipate the workforce needs of the life science community and to promote the advancement of life science talent throughout the world. So we're excited today to partner with Illumina for today's event. Illumina is a biotechnology company located here in San Diego, whose innovative sequencing and array technologies are fueling groundbreaking advancements in life science research, translational and consumer genomics, and molecular diagnostics. One of Illumina's largest philanthropic focus areas is STEM education. They partner with teachers like all of you uh, to achieve the goal of inspiring the next generation of scientists, engineers, and innovators, and support teachers in feeling able and ready to bring topics like genomics into their classroom. So the first of important people that I'd like to introduce is Vanessa Light, the Program Manager of STEM Education at Illumina. Can you say hello? <laughs> Hi everyone, um, it's nice to see you all and to be here today. Um, these programs and this outreach just it does not happen without you so I can't tell you what an honor it is for you guys taking time out of your day to spend it with us this afternoon and um, we appreciate all the work that you guys are doing in the classroom and outside of the classroom so thank you so I'd also like to introduce Howard Chan the Biocom Institute instruction and curriculum manager Good afternoon, everybody. I look forward to the second half of this call where I'll be presenting some online resources uh, from Illumina. And of course, most importantly, I'd like to introduce our industry speaker, Ashley Van Zeeland. Uh, she is the pres Vice President of Product Development, Business Operations and Systems Integration at Illumina. Uh, Dr. Van Zeeland has been leading innovative genomics research and development programs for more than 15 years and is currently Vice President Product Integration and Cons Consumer Collaboration at Illumina. As I mentioned, previously she was co-founder and CEO of Cypher Genomics, a cloud-based gen genome interpretation company, which sold to Human Longevity Inc. in 2015. At Human Longevity Inc., Dr. Van Zeeland served as Chief Technology Officer, directing the software and bioinformatics development for a large-scale genomics platform and enabling health intelligence and related products. Dr. Van Zeeland sits on the board of Headlamp Software, Inc., and advisory board of Vivid Genomics and Luna DNA. She has been the recipient of numerous business and science awards, including the Biocom Life Science Catalyst Award, the UCSD 40 Under 40 and Emerging Leader Alumni Awards, and San Diego 500 Influential Business Leader Award. She holds a PhD in neuroscience from the University of California, Los Angeles, and an MBA from the University of California, San Diego. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Ashley. All right, thank you so much, Marissa, for that warm introduction. And uh, thank you to Biocom Institute for the uh, invitation to come and kick off this industry speaker series. Um, and, and, you know, of course, thank you to all of you for taking time to join us, as Vanessa said. Um, I couldn't be more excited about this topic, about this opportunity. Um, I have educators in my family, and so um, it really truly is a pleasure to share with you all the ways uh, our STEM fields and particularly genomics are really serving us in how we are responding to the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic and how I think you, you have an incredible opportunity to really dig in um, and help your students understand and see how the you know, scientific process is playing out uh, in a real way 
uh, as we kind of navigate this crisis together. So I'll uh, give a little bit more about my background, uh, though that was a great intro and I think you heard most of it on how I got here um, and uh, takeaways that maybe you can take back to your students. Um, and then spend most of the time just talking about how uh, genomics has contributed to our understanding of the virus that causes COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2. Um, and uh, finally spend a few minutes on why I think this is such an incredible time to be uh, in your shoes and uh, how we all have to embrace, I think, a paradigm of lifelong learning ourselves. Um, because I think, you know, we've seen certainly this year that we've never been confronted with something uh, like this uh, in recent memory. And so we're all kind of navigating our way through it. Okay, so how did I get here? Um, you heard my academic background. Um, and so probably like many of your high school students, um, I was really interested in biology and the life sciences. And so I thought I would pursue some sort of professional clinical career, like a medical doctor or a clinical psychologist, um, went to University of Colorado and, and became really interested in brain development, so majored in psychology and neuroscience. Um, and then I had an opportunity to do research while I was applying to medical school. So took the MCAT kind of very linear path there. And it was in that research at UCLA where I was using brain imaging to understand the brain development and function of children with autism that I just kind of fell in love with science and the scientific process and the creativity. And so I stayed for my PhD in neuroscience. Um, and again, still thought it would be very linear. I would uh, follow the academic trajectory. I would uh, become a professor. And so I uh, pursued a postdoctoral fellowship down here in San Diego um, at the Scripps Research Institute, focused on the computational side of how do you bring together genomic information with other types of information to really make discoveries about how genes influence, um, in my case, kind of brain development and, and function. But when I got here, I was really struck by the incredible synergy that can happen between kind of academic and industry research pursuits. Um, and I thought it was a really interesting space. And so then I kind of started going off that scripted path. And I really started to, to kind of dive into this new space. And you heard I pursued an MBA uh, here at UCSD. And that kind of changed the way I was thinking about how do we solve these problems? How do we leverage kind of big science um, to do great work um, and, and bring products to market? And in that path, I had this opportunity to co-found a company, Cypher Genomics. So we spun that out of an academic research institute. Uh, had the real honor of, of building that up over about five years from idea to exit. Uh, when we were purchased by Human Longevity. Um, worked at that larger company for a while and then ultimately had this incredible opportunity to join Illumina in my current role in product development. And so I think uh, one of the, the things that um, I wish I had heard as I was a student is it doesn't have to be so predictable and doesn't have to be so linear. And so those opportunities to recognize that the careers that your students may have in the future may not even exist today um, because we're, we're constantly creating new fields of study and new uh, innovations and technologies and being open to that, um, I think is, is something that uh, my younger self would have benefited from hearing. Um, so I'll leave you with that and, and we'll kind of switch gears because if my career path was unscripted, I would say 2020 uh, has definitely been unscripted and, uh, and we're all experiencing something, you know, completely novel and uncharted in our lifetimes. The other thing that, you know, really strikes me as I've kind of observed and, and gone through this year myself is that we're really witnessing the scientific method play out in real time on a global scale. So we're seeing avenues of understanding kind of explored and false starts and rethinking things that we thought we knew and what works and what doesn't. And it really is just putting all of that out there. And, and I think it's so important that we take that opportunity to continue to teach and, and engage about why this critical thinking and scientific process is so important. Um, and so that, that was why I was particularly excited to get to speak with you today. 
The other thing that has been a silver lining, I think, in all of this is that we're really seeing how, you know, practically every STEM field is bringing the absolute best thinking to the table to address this crisis. So whether it's in virology and epidemiology and genomics, which we'll deep dive, or engineering and social sciences and artificial intelligence, um, we really are at an unprecedented time in history where we have so many tools that we can unpack to try to, uh, to address this crisis that it is very, very heartening. Okay, so just to paint this picture, I want everybody to take a step back and put yourself wherever you were in December of last year, right? And so it feels probably like an entire lifetime ago, but December of last year, holiday plans, New Year's plans, traveling to see friends and family. Um, and in China, what was happening is there were about four cases that were starting to present of this pneumonia of unknown origin. Um, so shortly after these cases were, were presented, um, astute uh, kind of physician scientist noticed this and isolated the virus. The absolutely incredible thing that happened that has never happened before is that within days of that virus being isolated in China, sequenced uh, on an Illumina sequencer, that sequence data was shared globally. Um, and so everybody who was interested and who was following this, even when it was a handful of cases, could have access to kind of understand what was happening. The other remarkable thing that happened is in very short order, kind of understanding the risk of where this could go. Uh, Moderna, uh, a vaccine development company, and NIH, based on just that published sequence alone, half a world away, finalized the design for their mRNA-based vaccine candidate in just two days after that data had been published um, in China. So from there, uh, it was just another week later that we had the first case reported in the US. Um, about 10 days after that, you know, it had gone from those four cases in China, you know, one case here. By the end of January, it was about 10,000 cases already in 21 countries. So we knew that this was spreading rapidly. Um, I'll come back to that, but but the crazy thing is that that was one month. You start now doing the clock for month two. By February 6th, again, because we had the sequence data, we had uh, cases, the FDA was able to approve the first diagnostic test for emergency use um, already in early February. And by February 7th, that first batch of vaccine uh, material was being manufactured for clinical trials. So an incredibly fast timeline. We all know how the rest of this story plays out. Um, obviously, by, by March, China was up to almost 80,000 cases. It was spreading into the hundreds globally. Um, but the, the positive thing here is that by March 16th, Moderna dosed their first patient uh, in a phase one study for safety. And so if you look from January 7th, when it was isolated, to a week later, we had a vaccine candidate based on sequence data to just two months after that, it's going into patients. We've never seen anything like that, you know, really in the history of humankind. And so I think we have the chance to really write these new scripts um, as we go forward. And this really is, you know, a completely, I think unprecedented will we'll win the word bingo of 2020, um, but this is the only word that captures what's happening, um, especially as we look at the pace of scientific progress. So when you look back at other recent pandemics of respiratory uh, viruses like this, so the first SARS outbreak in China in 2002, it took about six months for that first viral sequence to be published. Fast forward 10 years later, MERS, another respiratory uh, kind of same family respiratory virus out of the Middle East, there was an outbreak in 2012, took uh, about a year to sequence and publish that genome. So then in contrast, taking just two days, three days really, uh, to sequence and publish SARS-CoV-2 is still mind blowing to me um, 10 months later. And that was just the beginning. Uh, so we've had over 50,000 scientific papers that have been published as of this summer uh, when, I, when I looked up some of that data. And uh, just the other day I went and visited uh, 
data sharing platform uh, for viral genomics, GISAID, for infectious disease. And there have been over 140,000 viral sequences shared as of this month. So there's some major uh, new technology innovations from open science and data sharing that are allowing us to move science uh, even faster than we have before. And again, uh, the fact that we're even on a path to an approved vaccine within a year of identifying the viral uh, isolate, um, I think is, is testament to that. So talked about, you know, deposition of all of this data. Well, what do we do with all of that data, right? And why do 140,000 viral sequences matter? Well, um, there's a couple of things that we can learn both from the genome of the virus itself, as well as from the, the genome of the host, right? And in this case, the host is, is us. Um, when you look at the value of sharing the viral DNA on these, on these platforms, it really comes down to uh, tracking, testing, and potentially treating. So tracking, what I'm showing here is kind of a viral family tree, if you can think about. So each of these lines um, is when a certain kind of family member of that virus was appeared uh, over time, and it's color-coded by geography. And what this allows researchers to do is trace where we have transmission patterns. And that's really, really important for informing public health um, decisions and understanding how the virus is also mutating over time. There is uh, a chance that particular viral mutations can be more or less infectious or cause more or less severe disease. And so that's actively being studied based on the sequence of the virus itself. On the flip side, if we want to understand kind of from the host genetics perspective, how, how are you responding to infection or how susceptible are you to infection? It's really about predicting and protecting people. Um, and so there have been a number of these global consortia of academic scientists and industry participants uh, coming together on both fronts to really support a lot of research into these areas and move as quickly as we can. Um, and so I think um, there'll be, you know, much more research to come in these spaces and, and we're actively supporting these as well. Um, but it, I think, speaks to this underlying foundation and why we're able to go so quickly is because we have these data platforms, right? And we have the tools and we have um, the, the trained personnel to go in and ask these uh, wonderful scientific questions. So digging in a little bit deeper on how genomics contributes uh, directly into our response to COVID-19, one of the things that it really helps inform is the design of diagnostic tests. So one of the most common tests uh, looks for specific sequences of the viral genome and kind of replicates it many, many times to see if it's present uh, in, in the sample. And this is uh, PCR-based. You may have heard that term or you probably already know it. Um, and so how you use that sequence information to design a very sensitive and specific test is key. There are other tests, both antibody tests and antigen tests, that test for proteins, right? An antigen test tests for proteins on the surface of the virus to see if it's present in the sample, right? And so is it actively, uh, in, uh, are you actively infected? The antibody test tests for proteins that your body makes in response to an infection and is good for signaling if you've previously been infected. And so both of these um, are on the market as well as the molecular tests uh, for coronavirus. And one of the incredible things is that we're also opening up new product families of tests based on CRISPR techniques um, to create you know, faster, accurate, and less expensive tests as well. So looking over at vaccines on the other side of the coin, um, I've already shared with you that uh, the viral genomic sequence uh, was a major contributor to the ability in creating a vaccine candidate, you know, in very short order after identification of the, the virus, 
Um, that is now in phase three. But there are multiple shots on goal here uh, that are being pursued by you know, well over 120 companies in this space today. And the one I, I talked about before, the Moderna one, is really in this class here about you know, really targeting, um, in this case, an mRNA and RNA virus uh, a candidate to go train your immune system uh, what to recognize. There are other viruses, uh, vaccine candidates that we've used historically for our MMR vaccines, our chickenpox vaccines, polio, that use uh, kind of versions of uh, you know, uh, weakened viruses or inactivated viruses to train your body to respond to it. At the end of the day, what is truly, truly remarkable is that this was as of yesterday, we have 11 vaccine candidates already in phase three. And this took a massive mobilization uh, and creative thinking for how to shorten each phase of the vaccine development process, but do so in a very safe and responsible way. So just to give you some kind of grounding, typically the vaccine development process can take about 10 years. Um, the record before now has been about four years. Um, and so I think you know it, it really is a testament again to how uh, the best and the brightest are really trying to come and uh, bring uh, everything, all the tools that we have to fight this pandemic. I'm in biotech. I love technology. Um, but not everything has to be so high tech based. And there are a number of low tech uh, interventions that we have at our disposal as well. And I think this is also one of the most interesting areas where we've seen uh, the scientific process, you know, again, play out in real time where we've had to do lots of studies to understand how transmission occurs, right? If you take yourself back to January, February, March, you know, unclear at that moment, whether it was surface-based or predominantly um, airborne-based. And so research had to happen. Um, it, that, that has actually happened. And, and this is a great figure from a science paper from not too long ago just looking at how droplets and aerosols uh, that are transmitted, whether you're uh, infected and asymptomatic, infected and symptomatic, can really be reduced by simple things like mask wearing, being outdoors, maintaining that six foot social distance. Um, so we've now created a body of research and a body of science that supports um, these kinds of public health measures, which are really critical. Obviously hand washing, you know, Mom's always right, you got to come in and wash your hands. Um, very effective in uh, killing virus and stopping transmission as well. So it's not always about the high tech, um, but the low tech and understanding why hand washing, you know, kind of breaks apart that viral uh, little capsid is really important as well. So I hope I've been able to share with you just a couple of the ways that at least genomics has contributed um, in very real ways to the response to COVID-19 and the pandemic um, that you know, we're all in uncharted territory here and uh, that the scientific process very much helps and is active and uh, helps us navigate through crises like this. And um, it, you know, always looking for a silver lining, this is a fantastic opportunity, I think, to make STEM and science and the impact that it can make real for students and get them very much engaged in all of the different ways we need this kind of thinking and problem solving and technologies uh, for crises like this. And it doesn't have to be this. Um, you know, if, if uh, students are interested in solving a climate crisis, we're confronting, you know, uh, cancer and how do you uh, treat cancer? How do you cure cancer? Um, how do you, you know, arm against future pandemics? STEM has a huge role to play um, in all of those. And so I just want to close with a couple of thoughts on uh, ways you might uh, kind of use your influence to develop that next generation of scientists and engineers and innovators uh, who will lead us through the next challenge, whatever that might be. So as I was uh, preparing this, I was, I was reflecting back on you know, we all have those teachers 
I think that make an outsized impact on our life. Uh, for me, it was my 10th grade uh, chemistry teacher, Miss Carpenter. Um, I could see how excited she was about chemistry. Um, I had never been that excited by it, but being in her class, feeling her excitement, um, it, it really changed the way I thought about the sciences. And, you know, every day because of her, we celebrate Mole Day. That's coming up. I'm very excited about that. So don't forget October 23rd. Um, I'll never forget it. And, um, and I think that's the impact that you can have. Is it, you know, seeing a woman in that space, seeing her natural excitement, um, getting me excited about it, it made it very approachable and very fun. And uh, I also wanna kind of take the pressure off that it doesn't have to be you. In this virtual environment, we also have platforms like Skype a Scientist, um, other ways you can get uh, guest speakers into your classrooms um, or you know, outreach programs where your students can see what a scientist or engineer or physicist really is, right? And kind of break those stereotypes about it being kind of stodgy old men, no offense. Um, you know, doing kind of solo work. It's very dynamic. It's very diverse. It's very active. Um, so I think that that's such an opportunity. And as I've talked about throughout the presentation, you know, a lot of STEM is just, you know, how do we confront a problem? How do we learn? How do we keep up with new innovations? How do we um, stay apprised of, you know, there's an entire new field emerging uh, with coronavirus and, and COVID-19 studies. And so this is really happening in real time right now. Um, I think it's a great chance to uh, spark that curiosity and point out, you know, that sometimes science leads you down the wrong path and you're going to fail and you're going to make mistakes. But if you come back, you revise your experiments, you look at the data, you update your models, you keep going and you keep asking why, why not, what's working. Um, and that resiliency is so crucial uh, to build. Uh, in that next generation of, of STEM leaders. So if you're feeling overwhelmed uh, by how do you get into something like genomics and bring genomics to your classroom, um, very good news. Uh, you'll hear more about the specifics of that later, but all I can say is that this is, in my mind, the perfect opportunity to learn as it, as it happens. We're only at the very beginning of the impact that something like genomics will make um, on you know, health and agriculture and uh, genetic disease and research. So you can see the numbers here. We still, with all the great technology that we have, understand very little. So lots more research will happen here. Many new kinds of jobs will be created. And so it really is about that curiosity, about that critical thinking process and about that resiliency that I think are, are key to instill in students who are interested in going into spaces like this. And so with that, I, I want to wrap and, and thank you so much again for joining this afternoon and engaging in this and thank our partners at the Biocom Institute uh, for bringing us together. Um, and uh, they're going to, like I said, dive into some resources, but very happy to take some questions and uh, please stay connected. Here's my Twitter, Illumina's Twitter. Um, you can find us. I think this is an important conversation that we do want to continue to support and support you in your classrooms. Um, as a parent of children, I, I do sincerely appreciate what you do for our communities. Awesome, thank you. We had a couple of questions. So you guys, if you have any more questions, please type them in the chat box and I will um, let uh, you know now. So one of the questions was, aren't RNA vaccines very lab uh, label and require extreme cold storage? That is a very good question. Um, and I, I want to be careful not to get too far out of over my skis here, but you're right. They are um, not super stable and do require uh, cold storage. And so I think when it comes to the difference in understanding between approval of a vaccine candidate and then what it takes logistically and operationally to get that out into communities and you know clinics um, and ultimately hopefully into your arms, um, there are multiple steps that we have yet to go after approval. Thank you. And uh, second question is, how relevant do you think it would be to look at viruses in bats to help prepare for future zoonotic transfers that might become infectious to humans? 
Fantastic, uh, fantastic question again. So a uh, very active area of research as I understand it. Um, I think this is probably one of the opportunities, um, you know, it was kind of an existent field. And I think the last thing uh, when I looked into this was, it, you know, certainly growing in the number of investigators and funding going towards uh, exactly that. How do you look at risks and what allows that transfer from animal to people and protect against that in the future? Um, so it's not my field of study, but I know it's, it's very active and growing now. This is more of a personal question, but do you know Ralph Imandi and Linda Sanchi who were at Scripps in neuroscience? They're stu for students. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Um, the, the, the names are a little bit familiar, um, but uh, to be fair, so I did some neuro work at Scripps and then mostly was actually in statistical genetics and bioinformatics uh, when I came down. So I, I was trying to combine multiple fields. Yeah. Awesome. Anybody else have any more questions? And if you feel like you want to unmute yourself to ask, you can. Um, we have a question, is the COVID virus mutating? So the, the uh, virus that causes COVID is mutating. Um, it is mutating at a comparatively slower rate than something like our annual influenza. Um, and that's for a, a number of reasons. Um, but it does, it is mutating uh, there is research going on into certain mutations and are they more infectious or cause severe disease relative to others. Um, there hasn't been huge evidence for that. There's a little bit of evidence for it, um, but thankfully it's not a rapidly mutating virus. Uh, what types of traits or characteristics do you look for in your employees that teachers can instill in their students today? Um, so I think number one is this curiosity and resilience, right? There, there is something about innovation that requires that itch to go, you know, want to ask why, want to understand more, want to figure out a better way to do something. And that's where the curiosity comes in. I think the other piece, again, is coupled with that. If you're asking hard questions and you're trying new things, you're going to fail sometimes. And you have to be able to kind of pick yourself up, brush yourself off, learn from it, and keep going. Any more questions? Um, do you have any competing companies in your space? Good question. Um, so in the Illumina space, so we provide uh, the tools that help uh, open up the genomic sequences and arrays and a number of other uh, technologies as well. And so I think when you see an opportunity to make this big of an impact on human health and uh, things like cancer or genetic diseases like Alzheimer's, um, absolutely we're going to have other other uh, participants in this space um, who have a different way of solving the problem, right? Or maybe a very similar way of solving the problem, um, but I think uh, that that serves everybody well, right? A little competition uh, keeps those pencils sharp. Could you say a little bit more about the connection between science and business from your experience in studying and practicing both? Sure, I'll share, I'll share my experience. Um, so I think what I, what I felt as an academic kind of track scientist is I was really driven by trying to understand the big T truth and that's the right aim. But the other part of me really wanted to figure out how that would make an impact in somebody's life. And I think that's what kind of drew me to the business side as well is because by coupling those two, you can take incredibly amazing, cool innovations and discoveries that happen in the research world and find the route 
right, to get it to market and into a product form that can make an impact, whether it's a drug or a vaccine or a product like our sequencers, you know, to really um, take that scale out to the globe. So that's where I, I really like that space and I really like how they come together to allow that. Uh, does Illumina have an open house or somewhere where students can come see science in action to kind of demystify those stereotypes? That's a great question. And I'll actually probably uh, defer that to Vanessa uh, to talk about the specific resources. I know we have a number of programs um, on how we can kind of open up uh, the Illumina uh, community to students in various ways. Um, and so she, she really is the expert to speak on that. Yeah, I'll take that and then um, also tee up. Howard's gonna be talking a little bit about one of those opportunities in a little bit, but um, we do pre-COVID and hopefully post-COVID um, open our campus to um, groups of students. They are a smaller group of students because we go into our labs, we go into our customer training labs um, and get to experience those spaces. Um, and that comes with space restraint. So, um, but the answer to your question is yes, we do open it, but it's not on kind of an open house basis. It's a full day that we open our um, open our campus. We do an introduction to genomics and um, we have a career panel with students. We go into our labs and we do a campus tour. So um, hopefully we'll be able to open that to other teachers in the future, but for now it is a, a virtual setting that Howard's going to be talking about a little bit later with one of our educational partners. Okay, a couple more questions here. Um, this says, I've been told that having an MD and an MBA will open lots of doors for students, but do you please comment on any combination in terms of opportunities it may provide? Sure. Um, I have certainly found it beneficial to have so the, the PhD in the MBA, an MD in an MBA, um, an MD in a JD, uh, PhD in a JD. I mean, I think any of these have really unique value in being able to help bring, you know, kind of be a bridge to bring together two different ways of thinking, right? So I know lots of uh, patent attorneys, for example, who have either an MD or, and a PhD and a JD, um, or, you know, kind of somebody in a business role like me. Um, it, it certainly helped me kind of understand the problems we were trying to solve from both sides. Um, so if, if somebody enjoys education and school that much, um, I would fully support any uh, multiple degree combo. Awesome. Uh, last question that we have here is, um, is a major in biology, chemistry, or computer science a smoother route to genomics, or is there a smoother route to genomics? So I was really struck. Um, there's a slide that we have at Illumina that lists all of the different majors uh, that contribute to building our platforms and having a career in genomics. And I get to work with uh, aerospace engineers, um, physicists, optical physicists, surface chemists. Um, I mean, you name it. It takes a village to work on a problem that is this challenging. And so I think it's really whatever sparks the opportunity to develop those skills, right? I think that's really what it's about is you have to learn that critical thinking process. You have to learn how to do experiments. You have to learn how to kind of dust yourself off and keep going and ask the right questions. Um, and any of the STEM fields, I feel like can properly train you. And then it's just finding those career opportunities to get in. So I'm a psychology major and a neuroscientist working at a genomics company. Awesome. Lots of possibilities can lead you down the path, it sounds like. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I think those are all the questions. Um, we really, really appreciate you taking the time to uh, be with us today and provide us with so much uh, fantastic information. Um, and I don't know if you have anything else that you wanted to share. Otherwise, we'll move on. All right, wonderful. Thank you so, so much again for the invitation. It really has been a pleasure and thank you all for taking the time. All right, so we're gonna pass the baton on to Howard Chan, who is our uh, curriculum and instruction manager, and he is going to get started with some of the um, 
resources that Illumina has to offer for teacher for educators um, surrounding genomics. Thank you, Marissa, and thank you again, Ashley and Vanessa and the Illumina team for uh, hosting this today. Uh, we're excited to be able to share some amazing online resources that Illumina has created um, in the next segment here. So we're going to go over some about three or four resources for you to see. Um, we wanted to let you know, though, to honor your time, that the majority of these resources are going to be focused on the high school level for life science and biotech classrooms. Uh, once again, Marissa will be here to answer any questions in the chat box as we go through some of these resources today. Um, the first one we're going to show you is DNA Decoded, as you see here on the website. And DNA Decoded is a partnership between Illumina Foundation and Discovery Education where they've created lessons and activities that are ready to go, standard aligned lessons uh, for teachers to teach genomics education. And we're gonna explore these resources today to show you uh, what content areas they are covering. And I'm glad that Wendy brought up uh, zoonotics and that trans disease transmission to humans because that is one of the new lessons that uh, Discovery Education has created. So as you see, if you go into the Explore Resources page, You'll see 14 lessons that cover a wide variety of topics in genomics, from um, genetics to zoonotics to disease detectives to race and medicine, medicines in the future. And of course, you can't have a uh, Illumina lesson without a sequencing lesson. So there's a lesson here on sequencing. And as you scroll down, you'll notice that these are deeper dives uh, where these are multi-day experiences that tackles topics from the microbiome to mental health, to cancer and to other topic areas, which is deep space genomics and agricultural revolution. So you can see here, it covers a wide breadth of topics in the genomic industry and that the lessons are everywhere, everything from a one day experience, which is the ones you see up top to multi-day experiences, which are a deeper dive into uh, these content areas. The one I'm gonna show you today so you get an idea of what these lessons look like is the more recent one. And I'm glad when you brought it up, it's why bats, disease transmission to humans. So all you gotta to do to access this lesson is you just click on the link there and this will pop up a PDF. And the PDF covers all the resources that you're gonna to need to be able to implement this lesson. On the first page, you'll notice everything from the grade range that it covers, how much time you're gonna need for this lesson, and then a brief overview of what it's gonna cover. And in this case, it's covering uh, zoonotics. One thing I do wanna point out that's new to the discovery, a DNA decoded resource, are these boxes here that you'll notice in your lessons that are beige boxes. And what they did was, because a lot of you guys are now teaching remotely, um, they've added a adaptation here. So you'll notice anything that's in the beige box here, it will give you some um, strategies on how to take this lesson into your remote classroom. On the second page, it will quickly detail the objectives of your lesson. It will describe all the materials you need. In this case, you'll see that all the materials, all you need is on this PDF. And all you need is to have students have access to a device and internet. Uh, all the resources are either video links or an article uh, that takes you on the web. And like we said earlier, they're all NGSS aligned, as they will be detailed here, as well as Common Core aligned and technological literacy aligned. Now, the way this is laid out for this particular lesson it's a 45 minute to 60 minute lesson, which has students work in a group setting. And you can either do that in breakout rooms if you're doing remote or your traditional classroom, you're in groups. Um, it begins the lesson with a KWL chart and they even actually provide the link of a KWL chart here, which is this program here. And then what it does is your typical KWL where it requires students to, to fill out what they know, what want to know and what they learned. And it comes with videos. And if you click on these videos, it'll be taking you to YouTube. So I'm gonna play just a little bit so you get a, a little taste of what these videos are about. At 
a Maryland County Fair in 2017, the prize pigs were not looking their best. Farmers reported feverish hogs with inflamed eyes and running snouts. But while fair officials worried about the pigs, the Maryland Department of Health was concerned about a group of sick fairgoers. Some had pet the pigs, while others had merely been near their barns. But soon, 40 of these attendees would be diagnosed with swine flu. More often than not, sick animals don't infect humans. But when they do, these cross-species infections, or viral host jumps, have the potential to produce deadly epidemics. So how can pathogens from one species infect another? And what makes host jumps so dangerous? So a little preview of what the videos are. The way it, uh, kind of the activity works is that you're going to do a jigsaw where there are four articles. I'm going to scroll down to it. Article A, B, C, and D. And each student will be assigned an article. And then they're going to do a debrief using the CER worksheet, which is the claim evidence and reasoning worksheet, which is all attached on this PDF. And they're going to work on it as a group. So if you're in group A, you're tackling this article right here, which takes you to this website, Science News for Students. And if you're group B, so on and so on. And once they go through the CER worksheet, then they go back into a jigsaw where they're put into a group of four. And uh, each, per each person obviously is an expert in each of those articles. So it's a really fun way to um, engage students in zoonotic diseases and genomics education uh, in a simple um, lesson plan with all the resources attached. I'm gonna show you really quick. Here's the KWL charts that they have that you can print or, or download into a Google Doc in the CER claim evidence and reasoning worksheets. Any questions with DNA Decoded before I move on to the next resource? Um, I just wanted to mention with the DNA decoded. So, um, Howard, when you talked about the classroom activities versus the what they call DLBs or digital lesson bundles, um, those digital lesson bundles come with uh, a similar PDF that you saw. Also, it comes with a Google Doc, not a Google Doc, a power presentation, um, so that you can walk your students through that. Um, kind of side by side. So there's there's the lesson plan and then also the presentation. So that's just a one of the main differences besides the fact that they're all day sessions. Thank you, Vanessa. No questions so far, Howard. All right, moving on. So our second resource we wanted to share with you all today is the career exploration resources that Illumina has created on their website. And so uh, Marissa will probably put the link there. And on this website, you'll see uh, discovering careers in genomics. And so here, what Illumina has done is created uh, several, resor several resources for you to be able to explore careers in, uh, in Illumina, but in the genomic industry in general. And so what's great about this resource is it doesn't necessarily uh, focus in just on those science careers. And you see here, there are HR talent acquisition specialists and their senior territory account manager. So it really covers the wide breadth of careers that you can explore um, at Illumina and in generally the biotech industry. Um, what's great about this resource here on Illumina's website is that they've created videos and basically profile cards of each of the careers that are here. And so we're gonna show you uh, one of them, which is the clinical lab scientist here. Uh, So if you click on their PDF, you're going to get a basically a profile card that you can print out or send via Google Docs to your students. And it basically lays out um, what is required for this career, what skills, what average starting salary. Um, and what I really enjoy here is the day in the life of a clinical lab scientist manager. Um, what's great about this is that it also attaches a video um, of that particular employee at Illumina and talks about their day in the life. So I'm going to show a little bit of this. Um, yeah. I love to run. It's like 
a freeing experience, especially being just outside. I love running up mountains and kind of once you get to the top, you're just kind of viewing the beauty of it all. And it's also rewarding. It's like, ah, I did that. Hi, my name is Rita. I am a clinical lab scientist and I manage our clinical laboratory. A clinical lab scientist is a person that's working inside of a laboratory that is processing real patient samples. They are handling whole blood and taking the DNA out of it and then providing some type of result, whether it's just assessing the quality of the DNA or actually helping geneticists or physicians come to some conclusion as to whatever they're investigating. I'm going to stop there. Um, so back to the website here. As you notice, you can just click on the video. It'll take you to the YouTube. And then if you click on here, it'll take you to that profile card. Now, what we've done is we've attached a lesson plan to go with these seven uh, career profiles. And so we'll send that link out as well. And basically, it's a career exploration lesson plan that allows you to take those seven cards and do kind of a jigsaw as well. Um, and having them actually explore um, that same clinical lab scientist with other jobs that are out there um, in, other, in other companies and industries. And so we'll send you the career lesson plan as well on this link and after the call. Any questions on the career exploration resources from Illumina? No questions have popped up yet. All right. Moving right along. I know we only have a few more minutes, so I'm gonna to have to get through these last two here. The next one was something that Vanessa was alluding to of how we can get uh, access to some of the great Illumina employees and get a perspective of what they're doing in their jobs. Um, so Illumina is partnered with Skype a Scientist. Um, I know a lot of you are probably familiar with this resource. And so what they've done is uh, allow you to be able to request an Illumina Scientist so for those who are not familiar with Skype a Scientist, it's the way for you to be able to access a database of, uh, currently they have about 2,000 active uh, scientists who are available to Skype into the classroom. They've had at least at one point over 6,000 who participated in the program. So they got quite a uh, robust database of scientists, but Lumina has offered uh, many of their employees. And so they've registered on Skype a Scientist. So today I'm gonna show you how to request uh, scientists from Illumina specifically. And so if you uh, go down and get started, it will ask you if you're a teacher. So you want to click on sign up as a teacher. And what it'll do is it'll take you to a Google form. And it's going to ask you your standard demographics information, what school you teach, um, where you're located, your time zones, and obviously the important questions of when are the good times to be able to Skype into your classroom. Now I'm going to scroll down to the most important piece for you to be able to request a Illumina scientist. It is almost three fourths way down. It's this box right here. It'll say use this box to request a specific scientist. This is the place where you would put Illumina scientists in, in this text box uh, so that they know you're requesting somebody from Illumina. Now you notice here there is a link that takes you to the database. And if you click on it, this is what it will look like. Um, as you can, like I told you earlier, there are about 2,000 uh, scientists that are active right now that you could request and you can search. Now, one of the things that you're doing to protect our scientists, they're not putting uh, where they work. And so that's why it's important that you go back in here and type in specifically that you're requesting a Lumina scientist uh, and they'll make sure to connect you to one of them. But if you are just looking in general for different scientists, this is a great spot where you can do the search. So you can type in genomics. And as you can see here, there are several scientists who are available to speak on that topic. Um, there's a few things you wanna note when you're doing a search on this database. Uh, obviously, you wanna see what time zone they operate in, um, obviously what fields and what they study. But this last part is important also, because if you're requesting for multiple classes for you high school teachers, um, if you see something here where they only have one session left, um, that's, that's definitely something you wanna be careful of because you wanna have somebody who has multiple sessions that 
can cover your multiple classrooms that you have. So typically they run them in groups of, uh, they sign up as a group of six. And so you can see that Amy's already done five sessions and so she has one left. Um, so that's something to consider when you do your uh, database search. So like I said, again, um, it's important if you are requesting an Illumina employee that you type it in here during your application process. Any questions? One question, is Skype Assigned is available to college faculty as well as high school faculty? It's a good question. Vanessa, would you know that answer? Um, so my understanding is that, I mean, I, I know that it's, it's available to any teacher, to, um, to any teacher at any grade. So, um, so I would say the answer to that is yes. Um, and the nice thing about Skype a Scientist is that it is free um, for teachers and for scientists to participate in, which was one of the reasons why we decided to partner with them because we wanted to make sure that it was um, available to everybody. Great. Now, before we jump to the last resource, we do have a couple of poll questions for you um, that we wanted to get some feedback on. Uh, the first one is because uh, at Biocom Institute, our primary role is to support you guys. Um, and, and hearing what you guys need is important as we develop our programs and other uh, connections into the industry. And so our first poll question that I was hoping you guys can answer is this one. During these unprecedented times, what is the best way we can support you in the classroom? Um, so you can click multiple, uh, you don't have to just choose one. So you can choose multiple of what, what's important to you and the ways we can support you from the Biocom Institute and Illumina partnership. It's coming in and almost got everybody. All right, I think that's about everybody. I'm gonna end the polling here unless anybody wants to last second here. All right, so I'm gonna show you what we have. It sounds like um, we've got a lot of those that you guys wanna have support in. And so this is good. I mean, um, it's good to hear about uh, industry speakers in your classroom. Uh, it looks like digital lab simulations is something that you guys are really interested in. So uh, we'd love to explore ways that we can uh, have resources around that. So thank you for that. Um, the second poll question that we're asking you is based on the three resources that we just shared, uh, DNA Decoded, uh, Skype a Scientist, and the Career Exploration. Uh, what do you see yourself using right away? All right, almost there. Awesome. And I will just do a, a quick plug or idea to present to you all is um, between the DNA Decoded and the Career Exploration Resources or Skype a Scientist, um, one of the nice things that we've seen teachers um, how, when they've actually implemented this in their classroom is to do the DNA Decoded content, but then as a supplement to that or embedding it into that lesson plan to connect with a scientist. And again, it doesn't have to be, it could be a zoologist. It could be, um, you know, it doesn't have to be somebody from Illumina. It, um, so just a thought of how you can use multiple of these resources together um, to bring these lessons to life. All right. The last resource we wanna share with you today is our new uh, K-12 Life Science Biotech Educator Community Group. Uh, we've created a Facebook group and we just launched it. So we would love to have you connect here. Um, this is a place where um, life science biotech educators can share resources. They can see what resources are coming, events that are uh, coming down the pipe and ask questions and be able to connect with us and industry folks. Uh, so we want this to be a place for you guys to be able to uh, share your practices and lessons and all the good resources you're using in your classroom. So we're going to actually have a little bit of a incentive for joining the Facebook group uh, and announce it with you guys here today. So if you uh, join the group uh, from today or all the way up to this Sunday, October, what date is that, Marissa? Sunday the 25th. 
if you are in the Facebook group, by Sunday the 25th, you will be eligible for a raffle prize. Uh, we will select 10 people from the group to win a Starbucks gift card on that following Monday, and we'll announce it on the Facebook group. And so we encourage you to jump on the Facebook group, post questions, post resources, uh, post an event that's related to the life science biotech educator community. This is just gonna continue to grow and grow um, as we reach out to uh, all the schools around California and beyond. And we actually have on here, first question that we wanna put on you guys, because we love sharing and we love to hear what you guys are using in the classroom. So you'll notice I posted something on our Facebook group is what is one online educational resource you're using today in your classroom? I know all of you are always looking for new resources uh, to teach into your life science and biotech classroom. So that'd be a great place for you to participate and put your comment in, in the Facebook group. All right. Awesome. And this Facebook group might be a good place to, if you guys have these questions about, you know, you have an event or you're a HOSA um, instructor and you're looking for a mentor for a group, like that might be something that you could put on here to make sure that, um, you know, that we can support you. Or if it's not from Illumina, maybe it's from another one of the Biocom partners. So just a thought of how to use that page. Awesome. All right, Marit, thank you all for uh, sitting through and listening to all these wonderful resources. We'll